nearly 7,000 times, the Hebrew scriptures declare the actual name of the creator of the universe. In fact, the Almighty said the reason he brought our nation out of Egyptian bondage with such a mighty display of power was so that the entire world would know that his name is not the Lord, not Adonai, not Hashem, not God, not Jehovah, not Krishna, Vishnu, or Allah. But according to the most ancient vocalized text of the Hebrew scriptures, his name is Yehovah. And just as the prophet Yoel prophesied concerning the upcoming tribulation, whosoever shall call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. This is the greatest story never told. It's all about Yeshua, the prophet, the promised Messiah. Join me here in the land of Israel as we take a chronological and archeological journey through the Gospels. You have never seen anything like this before. I'm Michael Rood, prepare for a Rood Awakening. The modern Christian perspective is 2,000 years and thousands of miles removed from the culture of first century Israel. That is the primary reason why it is extremely difficult to comprehend the importance and meaning of the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus taught. We view the world from our narrow end of the long funnel of world history, but to understand Jesus' ministry in the context of what his teachings meant to the Jews in his day, to those who were raised with both the instructions in the Torah and subject to the diverse religious systems that dominated first century Israel, we need to view the events recorded in the Gospels from their perspective. We are going back to the time long before the Gospels were written at the end of the first century. We are going back to the time that Nobody called him Jesus Christ. It amuses me when I hear people speak of Jesus Christ as if he were the son of Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Christ. They speak of Jesus Christ as a carpenter, and I imagine a wood sign outside their shop in Nazareth that read, Joseph Christ and Sons Carpentry. That doesn't make any sense because in the Greek version of the Gospels, he is called a technon, a technical builder. And they built with stone in those days. Wood was scarce and used for temporary forms and scaffolding, but not for building. Maybe the sign read, Joseph Christ and Sons, General Contractors. The pilgrims brought the 1560 Geneva Bible with them when they started their colony in the New World. Iesus, I-E-S-U-S -S, was the name that they were familiar with. And in the name of Jesus, they prayed and received the miracle that saved their lives. Every Thanksgiving Day, we celebrate their rescue by Squanto, a freed Native American Indian slave who came back to the continent as a Christian, who was introduced to Jesus by his former master in England. When the letter J was added to the English alphabet, it was placed after the letter I. I was pronounced as a vowel, I, and J was pronounced as a hard consonantal Y, Y. In 1611, the name now spelled Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, was pronounced as Jesus, the same as when it was spelled I-E-S-U-S. In modern English, the vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, because sometimes Y is pronounced as a vowel, as in jelly, and other times it is pronounced as a consonant, as in yellow. The letter J has recently taken on a sound for which it was never designed, and is still not used in Europe. Yugoslavia is spelled with a capital J, and only Americans mispronounce it as Jugoslavia. Jesus is as close to his Hebrew name, Yeshua, as the Greek language allows. 
In the English transliteration of his Greek name, I-E is pronounced as Ye. But there is no letter equivalent to the Hebrew letter Shin or the Sh sound in Greek. And though Sus means horse in Hebrew and pig in Latin, in Greek, Sus is a common substantive that is required to provide the declension of a noun to indicate case or number. Iesua, though a bit more accurate, really does not work in Greek. Thus, Jesus. But again, no one by the name of Jesus or Jesus was ever born in Israel. Before the birth of the child, the angel Gabriel came to Yosef with this instruction. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yosef was to call his name Jesus for what reason? He shall save his people from their sins? What does the name Jesus have to do with saving his people? It doesn't. Not in English, not in Greek, not in Aramaic, or any other language on the planet other than Hebrew. In Genesis 3.20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. This makes no sense in English. But in Hebrew, it is a common figure of speech, a word pun. He called her name Chava because she was the mother of all chai. Or in English, Adam called her Livy because she was the mother of all living. In the second century, Papias, a disciple of the gospel author, John, stated that Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew language, and several did their best to translate it. Early church historians acknowledged that fact several times in their writings, and Eusebius, the court bishop of Constantine, said that he saw a copy of the Hebrew Matthew, but was unable to read it. It was thought that all copies of the Hebrew Matthew had been expunged under the bloody reign of Diocletian, but it unexpectedly survived in the covert archives of Jewish scribes. To this date, a total of 28 manuscript copies of the Hebrew Matthew have been located among ancient Jewish manuscripts scattered around the globe. The ancient Hebrew Matthew tells a story that cannot be appreciated in either the Aramaic or Greek translations of Matthew. And at the time Matthew was finally translated into English, the importance of his name was completely lost. The angel Gabriel's instructions to Yosef in the ancient Hebrew Matthew reads, you shall call his name Yeshua for Yoshia. The words he will save is one word in Hebrew, Yoshia. Yeshua means Yehovah saves. Yoshia means he will save. Yeshua, Yoshia. From this point on, we are going to call him by the name given to him by heaven. Not the name given by Greeks, the English, or by those who mispronounce the letter J. Heaven sent a messenger to earth with the divine instruction to call him Yeshua. Why? Because Yoshia, he will save his people from their sins. The angel Gabriel instructed both Miriam and Yosef to name the child Yeshua, the short form of the name Yehoshua. Yehoshua ben Nun was the name of the servant of Moses who eventually led the nation of Israel into the promised land, spelled as Joshua in the modern English, but also translated as Jesus in the book of Hebrews. By the third century BCE, Yehoshua was commonly shortened to the more familiar Yeshua, but the meaning remains the same. Yehovah saves.
Not one person, not a stepfather or even his mother ever called her son Jesus Christ. The term Christ or Christos comes from the Greek word Christos, which means to smear with animal fat, which is how the Greeks preserved their leather battle gear. Christus is remotely similar to the Hebrew term Mashiach, which refers to the one who is anointed with olive oil to be the king of Israel. Though Mashiach is transliterated into the Greek text of John 1.41 and 4.25 as Messias, they are the only times that the transliterated Hebrew word is used in the Gospels. And both times the Greek text adds the explanation that Messiah means Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Peter acknowledged Yeshua's role as the prophet by quoting Moses. Throughout the Gospels, Yeshua constantly refers to himself by quoting the prophecy of Moses. The people repeatedly referred to him as the great prophet who should come into the world, an unmistakable reference to Moses' prophecy there are dozens of references to Yeshua as the prophet. But anytime someone voiced that he was the Messiah or the son of David, a distinctive shorthand reference to the Messiah, he commanded them to shut their mouths immediately. In Luke chapter four, verse 41 records, devils came out of many crying out, thou art the Messiah, the son of God and he rebuked them and did not allow the demons to speak, for they knew that he was the Messiah. In Mark 1.24, there was a man in Capernaum synagogue who had a demonic spirit. As Yeshua entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, he shouted out, leave us alone. What have we to do with thee, Yeshua of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Yeshua rebuked him, hold your peace, shut up, come out of him. The prophet Isaiah, Yeshua, declared that the Messiah would heal the deaf, dumb, lame, lepers, and the blind. And Matthew 9, 27 tells us, when Yeshua departed Jericho, two blind men followed him, crying, son of David, have mercy on us. Yeshua opened their eyes and he immediately charged them, see that no man knows. Knows what? That the Messiah, the son of David, healed them. Matthew 12, 14. Because Yeshua healed a man with a withered hand in their synagogue on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees went out and held a council. They conspired against him how they might destroy him. When Yeshua knew it, he withdrew and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. He charged them that they should not make him known. Why? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Yeshua the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles." He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax he shall not quench until, until he brings forth judgment unto victory. Then he will rule the rod of iron. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. The Messiah's first mission was covert. He had to accomplish it behind the scenes as the prophet, the suffering servant who voluntarily pays the death penalty for the nation of Israel who broke the blood covenant at Mount Sinai. He who knew no sin died in the place of the guilty party. After this is accomplished for Israel, the Gentiles will have their opportunity to trust and obey him. Yeshua said that he did not come to bring peace to the earth. He came to bring a sword, the two-edged gospel of the kingdom. That is the sort of division that separated the invented commandments of men from the eternal commandments of the Almighty. Just before going up to the Feast of Tabernacles, Matthew 16, 13 records, Yeshua asked his disciples, 
who do men say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Yemiel, one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? Shimon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeshua answered and said, blessed art thou, Shimon, son of Yonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. I didn't show it to you, but my Father in heaven showed you. Then he charged all of his disciples that they should not tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time forward, Yeshua began to explain to his disciples how that he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed by the Gentiles and be raised the third day. There is one exception to his secret mission as the Messiah. Just one time when he broke his own rule of silence during his entire ministry, and that was to a Gentile woman. This incident is a prophetic statement concerning the time of the Gentiles, a period of time in which partial blindness happens to Israel, and the Gentiles can be grafted into the root of Israel if they will hear and actually obey the prophet. After the first Passover of Yeshua's ministry, detailed in the second and third chapters of John, he stayed in Judea teaching and baptizing until the Pharisees got word that his ministry was gaining far more popularity than that of John the Baptist. Avoiding a premature confrontation, Yeshua departed into the Galilee. An 18-hour walk north of Jerusalem, he stopped by a well outside of Shechem and sent his disciples into a village of the Samaritans to buy provisions for the rest of their journey up to Cana. While they were gone, Yeshua struck up a conversation with a Gentile woman who had come to draw water from the well. When he asked her for a drink, she retorted that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans unless they want something from them, like a drink of water. It is true, even today, the Jews know the real history of the Samaritans while they make up the history that suits them. They hold to an altered Paleo-Hebrew version of the Torah, but will not read any of the prophets or the books of the kings because they detail that the Samaritans are actually Gentiles, who were imported into the land when the Israelites were carried away by the Syrian emperor Shalmaneser. Their Torah text, admittedly one of the oldest extant copies today, has more than 267 significant variations from the Jewish Torah. The most obtrusive divergence is their 10th commandment, which reads, Thou shalt worship on Mount Gerizim. During the conversation with the woman, Yeshua told her entire life story, including her disappointing love life. Realizing for the first time in her life that she is in the company of a true prophet, she asked Yeshua the burning theological question that had separated the Jews from the Samaritans for hundreds of years. Our fathers say to worship and sacrifice the Passover on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. The Jews say we must worship in Jerusalem, and Mount Moriah is the only place that sacrifices are to be performed. What do you say? Yeshua came back with a cryptic answer that 2,000 years later is still hard to comprehend. The woman replied with the typical answer that we still use today when we either do not understand or do not fully agree. She said, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will teach us all things. For the first time in his ministry, and the last time in his ministry, Yeshua is going to say something to this Gentile woman that he is never going to repeat, and he forbids anyone else from voicing. He replied, you are speaking with the Messiah 
right now. Stunned, the woman dropped her water pot, ran back into the city. She shouted in the streets, this man told me everything I did in my entire life. Is this not the Messiah? The disciples returned from the village with food, but Yeshua refused to eat. Seeing that it was not yet Shavuot, and there were yet four months until the fall harvest, Yeshua turned his disciples toward the city and pointed out to them that the fields were already white for the harvest. Out of the Samaritan village came the entire population, dressed in their traditional white linen halakim, to see the man who had told the woman everything she ever did. This is why Yeshua could not eat. He knows this is the day that he opens the eyes of the Gentiles. According to the Samaritans today, it was Yohanan, the 49th Samaritan high priest, who said to Yeshua, we heard the woman, but we did not believe. We hear your words, and we believe that you are the Messiah. You are the Savior of the world. Yeshua spent two days with the Samaritans, and after two days, he departed into the Galilee. Why, near the beginning of his ministry, did he declare to this renegade Gentile religious group that he was a Messiah, and never allowed that word to be spoken to his people Israel? because the prophet Isaiah declared that the Messiah would open the eyes of the Gentiles first. Why did he spend two days with these Gentiles? Because a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. It was a prophetic statement concerning the time of the blindness in part for Israel, there would also be the time for the Gentiles to be grafted into the root of Israel which would provoke the Jews to jealousy. When the Torah is written on the hearts of the Gentiles, and they, out of love, are compelled to keep the commandments of God, while eschewing the ordinances and commandments fabricated by the Pharisees, it provokes Jews to jealousy. They really do not want the Gentiles repenting and being obedient to the Torah even though they were to be the priests and prophets to the world. Like Jonah, they do not want the Gentiles to repent from their inherited paganism. They would rather be thrown into the sea than call the Gentiles to obey God's law. They want the Gentiles to accept their fabricated Noahide laws. Jewish pride wants the Gentiles to continue in all the pagan abominations that they inherited from Rome because when Gentiles have the Torah miraculously written on their hearts, it exposes the shallowness of their fair sake religion. They really want there to be two houses of faith, us and them in opposition to the commandment that specifically states that there shall be one Torah for both Israel and the Gentile that dwells among them. It was the plan of the Almighty to open the eyes of the Gentiles and have them hear and obey the words of the prophet of whom Moses spoke. Their Messiah confession and Yeshua's two days with the Samaritan Gentiles is just the beginning of this prophetic awakening. In four months, Yeshua will stop at the same village. But the next time, they will refuse to sell him anything for his journey because he will not play Gentile church with them on Mount Gerizim. He is going up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, just as the Torah instructs. And all he is going to get from these Gentiles are excuses for not following him or the real Torah. Nothing has changed. Very few Gentiles will actually hear and obey the prophet. They had their religions and their versions of the Bible to protect. Like the Samaritans, they might say Jesus is the Christ, but if the Torah is not really written on their hearts, 
their manufactured religion will keep them from following the one that they proclaimed savior of the world.